Maté, welcome back to Think Tech. We have a special show. I'd call it a Think Tech special. And uh, we're calling it, as we have called other shows this special week, looking back on Hiroshima 70 years later. Uh, and the reason we're having this show is because we're making a movie for OC16, which will premiere at 10.30 p.m. this Sunday and play seven times. And it's about the same title, looking back on Hiroshima uh, 70 years later. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we attended, make that Saturday, we attended the Ford Island ceremony on, uh, on Hiroshima, the, the anniversary, 70th anniversary. And a lot of uh, Japanese people were there. The Navy supported it. The city supported it. Uh, and, it was, and it was fireworks uh, from the city of Nakaoka. That was very, very interesting. And um, we thought, you know, that was, um, that was a public relations thing for the Navy and the city. But what about the real deal? Uh, we want to know uh, how people were affected. So we spoke to uh, a historian uh, by the name of uh, John Davidan at HPU. Uh, we spoke to an, a, a, a physicist, a, a scientist, about how nuclear energy and fission and weapons work. And now we want to talk to somebody who has plenty of time in Japan. And uh, that's Roy Kodani. Roy, thank you for coming oh, on the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, I do go to Japan quite often, uh, about four times a year on business, and so I've had a chance, and I've gone over 20, 25 years to Japan, so I've had the opportunity of talking to Japanese about this matter. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Roy is uh, the host of uh, Life in the Law, which plays uh, every Wednesday at 1 o'clock, 1 to 2. Uh, so that makes him an old pro at ThinkTech. <laughs> Thank you very much. I try my best. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I and I knew that um, f from years ago that you spent a lot of time in Japan, that and that you had a special affinity for the culture in Japan, and I wanted to get your thoughts on exactly how people react today, uh, seventy years later, because what happened was really devastating, and uh, a lot of people killed, but more than that, it was it was frightening. And it was traumatic for the whole society that this should happen. And all those people were killed and maimed. Um, so here we are. And you've seen it and you've talked to them. And I have some questions for you. How, how do they think about this now? Is this a big thing in, in, in the Japanese parlance? It is, a big, is it a big thing in their way of looking at themselves as a kind of an identity matter? Do they think about it, talk about it? And if so, what do they think and talk about it? Jay, I, the answer to your question uh, is basically a generational question. Yeah. Uh, and I uh, uh, divide the generations into first the elders who actually experienced war, and then you have those who are now maybe in the 50s and 60s, then you have the next generation, 30s and 40s, and then the, the last generation that I uh, refer to would be the younger people who has no clue as to what really happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, I'm going to concentrate more on the elders who had actual experience uh, with the, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, before I go on, I should say to you that my father's side of the family comes from Hiroshima. And ironically, they come, they were uh, close to where the center of the bomb fell. And uh, <clears throat> so I have had a good chance to talk to relatives and friends in Hiroshima and Nagasaki because I have friends and clients in Nagasaki. Now, concentrating on the elders who really experience war, they tell me, first of all, they are grateful to the United States for what uh, the United States did for Japan after the war. You know, they were very generous and kind. They said no other nation in the world and in history, when you defeat an enemy, you take good care of the enemy. So they're grateful for that. But <clears throat> they also say, They also say, uh, and this uh, uh, 
is usually after a few drinks of sake when the, their, uh, they've become more liberal in what, whatever it is they discuss with me. They say that the dropping of the bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a justification for two things. They say it was a justification for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they say that it was also justified because uh, this was a faster way of ending the war. However, in uh, talking to my uh, friends and clients, mm -hmm. they also ask me, and I don't know the answer, but... Uh, yeah. Okay. They, they ask me, if this, uh, the bomb had been uh, completed and ready to be used against Germany, whether the bomb would have been used against Germany. And essentially what they are implying to me is that maybe they bombed it on Japan because the Japanese were Asians and maybe they were less sensitive to the fact that the bomb was dropped on Asians whether, rather than on Europeans uh, who were also at war with Americans. So that's one big factor. And you don't hear too often about that. But if you are able to speak to the older Jap Japanese, they will talk about that. And as you know, there are still elderly Japanese who are very nationalistic. And so these are the, the nationalists who refer to the racial uh, question, mm. whether they would have dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Another thing that they mentioned to me is that by the time the bomb was actually dropped on Hiroshima, uh, Tokyo had been firebombed, and it was just devastated. They, they say that in Osaka, uh, it was also devastated. And the thing that the Japanese and Asians uh, uh, try to do is to save face. And if they could have saved face somehow, that they would have uh, you know, asked for peace. I think they were making some inroads with the Russians, if I recall correctly. But the Russians did not. Uh, open themselves to uh, negotiation for peace, and so the bombs were dropped. And, uh, but they say by August of 1945, Japan was devastated. It's interesting that uh, a couple of days ago we had John David, an historian, and he talked about the Pots Potsdam Agreement, mm -hmm. which was a very short time before August of um, 1945 where the, the, um, the Allied powers agreed that nobody would negotiate with Japan, that there had to be an unconditional surrender, and nobody could break ranks on that. And that's, uh, according to his view of the history of it, um, that's the reason that the U.S. actually rebuffed possible negotiation of a, of a peace, because they were not um, authorized uh, by virtue of that agreement, that solidarity agreement. Uh, to, to cut a separate deal uh, except for an unconditional surrender. And that somehow played in all of this, in Truman's decision, I think. Well, the, uh, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but I think Japan was ready to call for peace before the bomb was dropped. Yeah, well, 220,000 people were killed in the fire, fire bombing of Tokyo. That that's, was really bad. Correct. Yeah. And uh, I uh, know and still uh, talk to some of the people who lived in Tokyo. And I remember once when I was in Ginza, and my client stepped out with me and said, Kodami-san, all of this in 1945 was just black. Said, no building was Leveled. Standing. Leveled. Yeah. And hardly any building was standing. The building that was standing was that uh, insurance company <coughs> where MacArthur uh, had his headquarters. I think one thing that the Americans did correctly was to keep the emperor in his position. 
because the Japanese in 1945 were very loyal to the emperor. And the fact that the Americans or MacArthur kept uh, the emperor uh, made it easier for the rest of Japan to follow and uh, become the nation that it was to become later. Uh, yeah. What's interesting, too, is that the emperor favored peace. He favored a surrender. And I don't know exactly what the mechanics were there at the end after August 6th, but I, uh, I think what happened is that he was the one. It was by virtue of his leadership that Japan surrendered. Right. And that if he hadn't been involved in those discussions, it might not have surrendered right. even after the atomic attacks. Right. That's, that's the, uh, the good and the bad of the imperial family, I think. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that uh, ultimately MacArthur became aware of that. Mm -hmm. And it, it played in the, in the post-war process uh, that you spoke of, right. which, I mean, I agree was really special. And it is special today, 70 years later. And the, it, was, it was almost, it was interesting that the way the Navy, the U.S. Navy characterized this celebration last weekend is 70 years of peace. Mm. Well, of course there'd be 70 years of peace. Japan is one of our closest allies ever. And so why would you even you know, suggest that there was an alternative to 70 years of peace. We, we've been not only peaceful, we've been lovingly peaceful with Japan for all these 70 years. Yeah. The only uh, uh, regret I think that I may have is the, the people of Okinawa. Mm. The people of Okinawa suffered uh, you know, the Battle of Okinawa, and then the Americans still have a base there. The Okinawans don't want a military base there, and uh, uh, the, Jap the Japanese government itself sometimes do not treat the Okinawans as I think they ought to, and for the sake of uh, national and international security, the military, American military base is maintained there, but uh, that's another issue. Is it, well, is it? I, I mean, I wonder if the whole Hiroshima chapter mm -hmm. somehow affects the way people in Okinawa feel about military bases. Uh, remember, they didn't much like the American military, and, uh, and maybe that's a symbolic thing for them now, 70 years later. It could be. I don't think uh, that they think like that. I think their principal concern is you know, all the, the noise, the pollution, the taking of Okinawan land. And, you know, there's some criminal activities that go on, and that's, that happens in any community anywhere. But it's uh, aggravated by the fact that it happens to be Americans. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Hiroshima happened uh, may, but I have not really experience any kind of emotional reaction by Okinawans and say, you know, it's, uh, the, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima is causing us any special grief. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's been 70 years. I want to ask you about the other generations sure. too, but it's been 70 years. Do you, do you find this a dynamic here? In other words, the feelings that people had, this generation, the, the elders, feelings they had right after the war have, have changed, or is it static and they just feel the same way they did before? My uh, take on this, your question, is this. The nationalists are very fervent. What hap whatever happened, whatever happens, and whatever will happen, they are so steadfast in their thinking that it's like any other uh, group of people. They're not going to change their thinking. Um, but the bulk of the Japanese people are truly grateful for the Americans and the fact that uh, the United States has had a national security cover for Japan. The, the budget the, for J the Japanese have slowly increased, but until recently, the money spent for military wasn't that great because of its uh, alliance with the United States. Mm -hmm. One more thing I, uh, on that point I would 
like to uh, interject is this. I think another thing that MacArthur ought to be um, commended for is the fact that he did not allow the Russians to take Hokkaido in the north because I think the Russians wanted to take Hokkaido besides the four islands and um, he uh, refused that. And because Hokkaido is part of the, uh, Japan now, I think it's, it makes a great difference, a big difference. Uh, the fact it's still part of Japan. Yeah. You know. Well, we had a different world today you know. if he had let uh, MacArthur had some vision about yeah. this, for sure. Another thing that I should mention is this. I forgot uh, if it was uh, Secretary of War Stimson or someone else. Uh, but one of the Americans had gone to Kyoto before the war. And I believe the American military policymakers said, let's bomb Kyoto. And because I think it was Stinson, uh, he said, no, Kyoto has a lot of temples and uh, cultural centers. So let's not bomb Kyoto. And I think, and I've said this to people from Kyoto, you should uh, thank the family of Mr. Stimson or whoever it was for not bombing Kyoto. If Kyoto had been bombed and destroyed like Osaka or any other major sport, like even Tokyo, Kyoto would not be the city it is now. Uh, yeah. So I think in that part, the uh, Japanese should be grateful. Yeah, there's a great amount of art and culture right. in Kyoto. Right. Let's, let's take a short break and come back and then let's talk about the reactions of the other generations that Certainly. you spoke of. That's Roy Kodani. He is our host on Life in the Law, Wednesday 1 to 2. Uh, but today he's my guest as we talk about looking back on Hiroshima uh, 70 years later. Uh, we'll be right back. I like science. Why science is actually fun. How science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life. Why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. <coughs> We're back. We're live. We're here with, here with Roy, Kod Roy Kodani talking about Hiroshima, now looking back 70 years later. And um, as it always happens during the break, little nuggets pop up. <clears throat> and Roy was telling me about the, the, the in the dead of night process. <laughs> and I, I would like to pursue that here on the air. So you're telling me about how people will talk to you mm -hmm. and say things late at night, mm -hmm. maybe with a little sake too. Right. <clears throat> you know, they would never otherwise say. Can you talk about that? Well, this is my experience. I, uh, I have uh, uh, come across many, oftentimes, the experience of having, and Japanese like to socialize. So I socialize with clients and friends. And uh, they love to uh, have a few um, sake. And as the night goes on, I, I have noticed that many people like to get it out of their system of talking to someone other than a native Japanese. And they will say, Kodani-san, you know, this is what we think. And uh, sometimes under the guise of maybe being inebriated, they will tell me things. And that's where I pick up some of this information about uh, you know, the bombing of Hiroshima and uh, politics and how they feel about many things. And I think, I, I don't know why it's not done or not spoken during the day, usually. It's usually late at night. And as the, the night gets uh, more and more later, uh, the truth seems to come out from these uh, people. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's in Japan or Hawaii that's or That's true. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of going out for a sake, too. <laughs> because you, you find out things and you, yeah. and you, and you do therapy. <laughs> no, you, you, you find out what people are really thinking. Well, let's talk about the other generations you spoke of, because that's really important. 
And the same kind of generational uh, shift has happened uh, in, in, in uh, Europe uh, with regard to World War II. And uh, I mean, you talk to some of the young Europeans, they don't know anything about what happened, and they deny it. And they say, are we tired of being criticized about this? Just let's move on. Uh, and, I, and I wonder uh, you know, whether the same kind of generational shift has taken place in, in uh, Japan. Well, let me start with the younger people. Okay. And I started earlier by saying some of the younger people are clueless. I am shocked sometimes when the younger people in the 20s and maybe early 30s say they go to the Hiroshima uh, Peace Museum and find out for the first time how horrific the bombing of Hiroshima is or was, uh, you know, I would think they would have known this better or more um, intimately because they, they're Japanese. But I, I think this is a reflection on the current society, Jay. The current society has uh, uh, lived in good times. During the late 80s and 90s, they had prosperity. Now they sort of uh, economically and financially, they're not as prosperous as they were before. But the younger Japanese have only experienced uh, prosperity and success. Those who are uh, older have also uh, have experienced good times. And so when it comes to unpleasant things, they don't think about it much, or they don't want to think about it much. And uh, so we're left with the people in the 50s who may have remembered or may remember, and then the elders, but the younger people. It's a different society now in Japan. And uh, <coughs> You know, I think, I think people don't realize that <clears throat> there are these, it's not a generation, it's two or three generations, but the country changes. Mm -hmm. It's like when, when um, the Japanese immigration, Japanese immigrants came to Hawaii, they left a country that was the Japan of the times, mm -hmm. say 1900, whatever year it was. <clears throat> if you look a hundred and some odd years later, it's not the same country. Everything has changed. You know, and, and I suppose they might remember if they had institutional memory over a hundred years, they said, gee, was, life was tough mm -hmm. when I left in the year 1900. But it's not tough now. It's pretty good. <laughs> so you don't realize the same thing in Europe. Exactly the same thing. You know, immigrants came and, and life was awful in Eastern Europe and back in 1900. You go back there now. You know, it's a, it's a modern day. You know, not so tough. <clears throat> and I think uh, I think we need we need to recognize that. Uh, Jay, that's a good good uh, observation because I'll tell you this is also quite ironic. Many of the values of the local Japanese, uh, the first generation are gone. Second, maybe there's some left. Third, fourth generation, the values are really what we call the Meiji uh, generation. It's the old Japanese uh, values uh, in the late in, uh, 19th century, and early 20th century. And so when some of these values are made apparent, to the Japanese in Japan. They think it's sort of, uh, you know, it's amusing to them that they're still left in this world, a residue of the Meiji generation Japanese. <laughs> right. And the words spoken here in Hawaii sometimes are no longer spoken in Japan. And, uh, and so you, you're very correct. You, I mean, the, the Japan itself has changed. But what values that, that were brought by the immigrants have remained in Hawaii. And it's like, I always think of Appalachia, you know. It's uh, fossilized in Hawaii, <laughs> the Japanese values. So. Locked in amber. Right. right. <clears throat> and forever. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. You don't change it so quick. Right. It, it's not that uh, any, for example, uh, a Japanese family goes back to Japan now. They're not going to change the way you know they are, or they they've carried down the culture. They're not going to change it. It's interesting, but it isn't a change effect. And so the same thing in Europe. Right. So anyway, you were talking about other generations. Well, the other generations are you know the say the fifties and sixties and those who are ready to retire. Um, 
this is the dilemma, I think. They, they all, everyone in the world, I, I believe, uh, wants peace. They want prosperity. They want the so-called good life. And they're, as I said earlier, they're thankful for America for part of that uh, peace and prosperity. Uh, at the same time, when these anniversaries come up <laughs> annually, they have they have this uh, uh, unpleasant memory or uh, things told to them about the war. And uh, as I said, the younger people don't want to even talk about it. And uh, the the fifties and sixties who are about to retire, it's still with them, and so. I think it's part of uh, a changing society in Japan. And they're, they're caught between memories of the old and the current economic and social life in Japan. You know. Yeah. But we always, uh, we, you know, we always, just an observation, we always have to remember the past so that we don't wind up reliving it. Uh, George Santayana. You know, I wasn't I'm the first one <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> but you know, we we can't we can't uh, you know for people who in, are in that generation who want to look forward mm -hmm. and forget about the old can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. This is not a good thing. You otherwise you wind up repeating it. And in the case of Hiroshima, mm -hmm. repeating Hiroshima is is uh, it's un untenable, mm -hmm. uh, completely untenable from every point of view. Uh, and so uh, this kind of event, which was so disastrous, um, is that makes it more necessary that we remember it. Because the more we remember it, the less likely it'll be repeated. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, uh, more things. Ah, OK, now. Japan, ironically, goes into nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors for energy, and it has one of the highest concentrations of nuclear reactors in the world, which is really odd considering that, uh, uh, you know, with MacArthur, the constitution that followed the peace uh, excluded nuclear weapons or the buildup of, um, you know, heavy armaments. I, I don't remember exactly what it said. Mm -hmm. um, but now, at the same moment, you know, Japan has, has grown it's a nuclear reactor, uh, the number of nuclear reactors around the country, uh, despite that. I mean, how, how does how, how do people in Japan reconcile that? We had a bad experience, now we're doing it more. Jay, I have uh, talked about this with uh, friends and relatives and whomever. They uh, say they are really caught between the rock and the hard place because they don't want to use fossil fuel because it affects the, the environment. And the other problem that they are becoming more cosmet, uh, cosmetic of is the fact that oil from, from the Arabian states coming across uh, the uh, Indian Ocean to Japan it's becoming a hazard because of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, expansion of power. So they can't, they can't afford to continue to have this pipeline of oil. Now, <clears throat> besides uh, fossil fuel, what other alternative do they have for energy? And that's nuclear. Um, and so they're saying that they don't want, they don't like it, but what alternative do they have? Many of them tell me, uh, many of these uh, uh, energy uh, sources um, is run by private companies. It's like any other, like Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, whatever. utility companies, yeah, which are private companies. Private yeah. companies. And they say what the private companies or the government ought to do is to have better regulation of these private companies because they feel they really don't have any alternative uh, to um, energy. And so they uh, at least tell me that the government ought to do something. But then, like any other utility company, they're stockholders uh, and they have a profit uh, 
motivation. So the companies also are caught in a bind. How much more can they do to protect the people who reside? How much there more can they spend? Yeah. yeah. And money to spend because then they will, the profit will become less. So they really are caught between uh, a very difficult, two difficult positions. Uh, uh, so, so are we caught. Yeah. We're caught with a need to take a break. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Godani. My old friend from, oh God, it, it, it's 50 years we know each other, right? I hate to say that. Looking back on Hiroshima 70 years later, we'll be right back. Aloha, my name is PJ and I'm the host of Hawaii Sports Update. I am very interested in local sports and that's why I host the Hawaii Sports Update show. I bring in guests from Hawaii, I bring in guests from UH, I bring in guests from the community, I bring in big names, I bring in small names, I bring in all names that are community related and doing positive things, sports related in the community. Come join me every Tuesday at 1 p.m. here on Hawaii Sports Update. You can also join me on my golf tournament, the first annual PJ Sports Radio Show Golf Tournament. It's going to be held at Coral Creek. For any information, go to Think Tech Hawaii INC and friend us. The PayPal and a summary of the event will be right there available for you. And don't forget to tweet us. Okay, we're back. We're live with here, we're here with Roy Kodani, looking back on Hiroshima 70 years later. During the break, we're also looking back on our time taking the bar exam within a, a few years of each other in the 60s. And, that. <laughs> and uh, looking back on that, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're both uh, three-digit lawyers, which is, means we're old. <laughs> but we're still smiley face and having a good time. So um, yeah, I wanted to get your feeling. So Fukushima was uh, like, I don't think the world fully realized how much mm -hmm. nuclear energy was going on in Japan and how comfortable the Japanese were in, in, in using it and developing it. And, and it was, it's a high tech thing and uh, they used their technology to make it work and it was working very well. Um, but then it's like, it's like, whoops, <laughs> maybe not so well. And I'm sure a lot of people in Japan were, had to be saying, uh, you know, we shouldn't have done this. Now we got burned twice already by nuclear energy. Did you, did you find that at all? Uh, before we go on, another interesting thing about our family. My father's side is from Hiroshima. My mother's side is from Fukushima. And oh, so... No, really? Oh, yeah. gee whiz. <laughs> so we were sort of double whammied uh, recently. Yeah. But um, uh, this is, this is uh, the situation, not the dilemma necessary, our sister situation. Many of the people in Fukushima wanted that power plant because it provided jobs. But the, the problem with the, the after effect of what happened after the tsunami was that it wasn't uh, constructed or regulated or um, administered with uh, high standards. And they, of course, at that time, they didn't realize it that it wasn't a high standard plant. It was after the problem that they realized it. And my take on this is, I do not know why. Maybe it's face, maybe pride again. But I think when that problem started, they should have called the American experts to come in. Who we, helped them with the plant in the first place, wasn't it? Right, right. And to say, you know, we, we got some problems. Would you give us a hand here? But for maybe, I think it's pride. I don't know what else I could think of that they didn't call the Americans. And by the time the first or whatever, and the second, and I think there were four, uh, not plants, but four or whatever it is, uh, it was too late. And so, uh, you know, I see whether the uh, Tokyo government is saying it's now safe to return, but the people who live close to that power plant is saying, no, it's not safe. We have our own measurement, and it shows that it's still contaminated. We don't want to go back. And um, so what do you do? You know? And then there's the cleanup, and all that contaminated soil and whatever, 
I understand it's placed somewhere nearby and contamination from radiation continues for hundreds of years. And, and the irony there is that this happened after Hiroshima and Nagasaki too. Right. People were burned. Um, nobody knew exactly how radiation was going to work. They developed all kinds of diseases. And it went on for a long time. There are, if you Google Hiroshima, as I have, you will see pictures of people years later who were maimed by what happened. And I'm sure this, this was an image that came into the minds of people after Fukushima that, oh, no, we're right. going to have this again. We don't want to be anywhere near this or the soil or the water or any right. of it because the same thing that happened in 1945 will happen to us again. Yeah, that is uh, a very sad commentary on life in Japan, I guess. Uh, and of all things, it's the, same, it's the same country that suffered the first atomic bombing, and now they have this uh, plant. Yeah. Uh, you know. So how does this affect, um, maybe we don't have an answer on this yet, but how, how does this affect nuclear energy in Japan? I mean, it's a scorcher what happened in right. Fukushima. Um, is this going to diminish the amount of nuclear energy? Are the other reactors back online? They I took them all off for a while, I yeah, think. I think one on the Sea of Japan side, uh, I know the government wanted to restart it. Whether yeah. it actually did, that's another problem. Yeah. Uh, not a problem, another issue. But as I started earlier, Jay, what alternative do you have for energy in Japan? not fossil fuel, wind power, it takes a lot of time before it comes up to par. So the only viable source is uh, nuclear. Yep. And uh, it's, where do you, where do you, um, you know, stop or where do you continue? Uh, they need energy. Uh, I don't, as you say, I, it's not, it's the same, I believe, the government in uh, Tokyo must be having the same discussion that we're having here. What do we do to maintain the same high quality uh, uh, or same energy that we, we had before Fukushima and yet not have the public get into an uproar? I think that's the that's yeah, issue. Yeah. Well, I think it's an issue all around the world. I mean, it's just as Fukushima had a a very negative effect on nuclear power in uh, Japan. It had a neg negative effect in Europe. I mean, as I remember, Germany uh, terminated its uh, nuclear uh, initiative. I don't know if they came back online or not. Uh, and certainly uh, the U.S. with Three Mile Island right. in 1979, right. uh, this was um, kind of an extension of Three Mile Island. Right. See how dangerous this yeah. stuff is. And the, what's only, the only difference is that in the United States, we have a land, a lot of land acreage, so you know you can spread out. Japan is so narrow that you don't have too much space to move. Yeah, that's. that's yeah. If you have contamination, it yeah. takes away valuable land. Right. And you're not even sure how much land is taking away that's from correct. you. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And then we don't know, like the, uh, like the atomic bomb victims, we don't know what's going to happen to the people, the young kids who were affected by this uh, Fukushima nuclear blast. No, or, yeah. no. And, it's uh, still a mystery. Yeah. Even after all these years, we don't know the effects it has on people. Right. Well, I'm sure it'll be, it'll be considered carefully. Mm -hmm. And I really I want, I mean, on the one hand, if, uh, if the Japan government said, we're, we're out of this, we're going to find another way. We're going to photovoltaic everywhere, <laughs> something. We're going back to coal, <laughs> something. Um, you know, uh, you know. It seems to me everybody would understand that, mm -hmm. especially in the case of Japan. Nobody would say, "How come they didn't go back to nuclear?" So, uh, you know, in terms of the world reaction, I would say they could go either way; it would be okay. Um, and if they went back to nuclear and started up all those plants again, and and fixed Fukushima and built more plants mm -hmm. using, you know, much more high tech. Mm. Um, you know, uh, high standard, yeah, security right. techniques over it. Uh, then, you know, I think uh, I, everyone would say they're very courageous, right. and they have the ability to integrate technology with their own history and find uh, this balance that, mm. that actually works in the 21st century. Yeah. 
the, you know, the risk that I see is the greatest risk is, is the risk of terrorism, because every nuclear plant is potentially a nuclear bomb. Yeah. Uh, now, if you guys, uh, you know, just remember that. <laughs> no, on that point, too, if I may say, I am deeply concerned of the Americans um, and any, like the Russians, I understand, after the fall of the USSR, there are many nuclear weapons floating around in the world. And now with all these terrorists, that is my greatest fear. Uh, you know, when will, when will they u be used? And uh, it's very scary. So what, what, what this teaches us, and probably the people in, in Tokyo who are having this conversation, probably factor it in also, is that uh, maintaining and controlling any uh, nuclear reactor now uh, is maybe more complex than they thought right. and more expensive. Not only do you have to have the systems that will make sure it doesn't, you know, do anything bad on its own, but you have to have the security to make sure that nobody else does anything bad right. to it. Uh, and then, so it makes it more expensive. Maybe it's still a bargain, though, because nuclear power is real cheap. <laughs> okay. Ah, question. Would you think, would you, the Japanese ever build a nuclear bomb? The answer, uh, from my, my talking to people, I think 90% of the people will be against any bomb, atomic bomb or nuclear bomb being uh, manufactured in Japan. They are so horrified with what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And if they are able to see some of these documentaries that were taken right after the war, it's horrific, Jay, horrific. And if these Japanese continue to see that, they will not uh, go with the manufacturing of uh, nuclear, whether it's bombs or um, you know, weapons or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think most, the, most people in the world, Jay, want peace. They don't want to yeah. have these. But it's a deterrent. And so this is why many nations which have this kind of weapons will uh, manufacture these nuclear weapons. But most, most average person doesn't want to have all these nuclear weapons anywhere. <clears throat> it's a really, um, when, <clears throat> when they developed that, um, the bomb <clears throat> in the 40s in where was it? Um, the Manhattan Project. I don't think anybody realized the shadow it would cast on humanity. The, the, the fact that the world had completely changed. And it was never so clear as when that mushroom cloud came up in Hiroshima. All of a sudden, you know, the world going forward became a different place. I certainly agree with you that, that the Japanese wouldn't, as far as I can see, mm -hmm. They wouldn't develop a bomb again. It's too close to their, their national culture. And the psyche. Yeah. The psyche. Yeah. <clears throat> On the other hand, I think right-thinking people, just as you said, right-thinking people everywhere wouldn't develop, shouldn't develop a yeah. bomb. There's got to be a better way to do this. And hopefully we can find that in our own way. Um, ah, so this is uh, my last question. <laughs> what role does this issue the issue of Hiroshima, the, the shadow that Hiroshima casts on, on uh, the history of Japan, and for that matter, by extension, the history of the U.S. and the world, um, it certainly was a traumatic, devastating event. What, what, mm -hmm. what role does that play in, Jap in Japanese politics today? Is it something that we would see a, a candidate refer back to? Is it something uh, where if you made a false statement, a, a faux pas, about what happened uh, on August 6th, that would be end your political career. I mean, how hot is this issue for politics? My, my take <clears throat> is this. Um, the average Japanese, again, your question is a very complex question. Everybody wants peace. They don't want to go to war. And yet, uh, I 
you know, it's the external forces that play a big part in the Japanese politics and in the Japanese-American relationship politics. And I refer without, you know, uh, I, I refer to China now. China is on its expansion mode. And so the Japanese don't want to get into a situation where they have to expand their military budget. And obviously, America doesn't want to spend its money and budget in uh, increasing its military forces in the Far East. But if you don't spend money for military defense, China will in misinterpret that and say America is weak. Japan will fall if America falls. And so the politics within uh, Japan is uh, unfortunately uh, affected by external forces, and I mean uh, China mainly. Of course, China has its own problems, but if it continues this expansion mode, Japan will um, have severe consequences. And what does, what does the average Japanese do for the sake of peace? Would they say, OK, we give up. China, you can do whatever you want. I don't think they would do that. But what is happening, very interestingly, is this, uh, Jay. A lot of, and I think there are no laws restricting land ownership in Japan. So many Chinese are now buying forest land in Japan. And uh, the Japanese are beginning to sell the, the forest land to Chinese. And the danger to that is forest land has water good, clean water. So if the Chinese buy these land, they may take the water back to China eventually. And China is, uh, you know, it's like, um, I've been to Peking, uh, Beijing many times. Beijing is like a desert, you know, sand and dry and no greenery. If they continue to buy and the Japanese continue to sell, then someday they're going to wake up and say, hey, we don't have any forest land left. It's bought by the Chinese. They might be able to uh, assert their power, the Chinese, without even declaring war. <laughs> Continue to, to buy land. Just then. corner the scarce resources. Right. Then what happens, you know? And uh, another thing that I ought to say is this. I know many young Japanese men and women uh, enlist in the military. But I think the bulk of the younger people do not have the same uh, nationalistic fervor that they had in the 1930s and the 1940s. Of course, many times it was forced upon them by the government. But uh, that's, that's my question that I have. If a foreign power continues to assert its power on Japan, what will the younger people do at that time. You know, they, they will have a moral question to answer. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's especially poignant there in Japan. Mm -hmm. Other places, it exists in, in similar fashion. Well, I think we've touched on some really important things, Roy. Thank you for uh, asking me to be your guest this afternoon. Yeah. Thanks for coming down. Oh, thank you very Thanks much. for all the thoughtful <laughs> comments, Roy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's Roy Kodani. He's the, uh, the host of our uh, Life in the Law show on Wednesday, 1 to 2. And today he joined me for a special discussion looking back on Hiroshima 70 years later. Thank you so much.